Good evening, you hearty souls. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for braving the weather and joining us. Uh, welcome to, uh, oh, for those of you who don't know, I am Charles Whitaker, Dean of Medill. Uh, and I'm here to welcome you to what I fully anticipate is going to be a very engaging and informative conversation uh, about the power of storytelling, the power to define, the power to mobilize a people, and particularly marginalized people, um, to inform communities, to sort of help us see ourselves. I often say to people that storytelling is the bridge that unites IMC and journalism here at Medill telling compelling stories, stories that move and motivate, has been a driving force of the human experience since the dawn of time. The method of delivering those stories has changed dramatically over the course of the human existence, but whether they're offered up on stone tablets or parchment or newsprint or a stream of code that becomes images and text distributed through cyberspace, the need and desire to consume stories remains potent. Uh, and thanks to, and uh, that's true in every field of endeavor that we train our students in here at Medill, uh, whether it's journalism, uh, IMC, or strategic communications. Um, and that's what I hope our interlocutors this evening will help us to explore. I could not be more delighted that, than to have the opportunity to listen to these three amazing individuals, and so allow me to introduce you to them now. First, we have Danielle Cadet. Um, who I've known since she was a mere babe here at Medill, <laughs> a child, I should say, um, and whose trajectory I've watched with great pride and admiration over the years. Currently, she is the executive editor and vice president of content at Essence. For the last decade, Danielle has dedicated her career to serving multicultural audiences and developing an expertise in the multicultural digital media space. Prior to joining Essence, she served as editorial director of Netflix's Strong Black Lead, where she developed the company's editorial strategy for its marketing efforts, targeting black audiences, leading campaigns for films like The Harder They Fall, Malcolm and Marie, and more. Prior to that, she served as vice president of content strategy and development and managing editor at R29, or Refinery29 Unbothered, a digital community catering to black millennial women. She joined Refinery29 from ESPN, where she launched The Undefeated, a digital destination that explores the intersection of race, sports, and culture. She oversaw daily editorial opera operations as daily editor, deputy editor, sorry. Prior to ESPN, Danielle uh, worked at the Huffington Post, Black Voices, where she led breaking news coverage of several national stories, including the Trayvon Martin murder case uh, in Florida and the fatal shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Danielle, as I alluded uh, to earlier, holds bachelor's and master's degrees from Medill. She's been included in the Creative Collective's inaugural 2020 creative class, Ebony's list of uh, dynamic black women uh, and editors in new media, uh, the big leads 40 under 40, behind the scene in sports, and Folio Magazine's Rising Stars. Next, we have Dr. Marcus Collins. Marcus is an award-winning marketer and cultural translator with one foot in the world of practice, serving as chief strategy officer of Wade and Kennedy, New York, and one foot in the world of academia as marketing professor at the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business. His deep understanding of brand strategy and consumer behavior has helped him bridge the academic practitioner gap for blue chip brands and startups alike. He's a recipient of the 40 Under 40 Award from both Advertising Age and Crane's Business. He's a recent inductee into the American Advertising Federation's Advertising Hall of Achievement. Most recently, he was recognized by Thinkers 100 and Deloitte among their class of 2023 radar list of 30 thinkers with ideas most likely to shape the future. Before joining Whedon and Kennedy, he served as the Chief Consumer Connections Officer at Donner Advertising and led social engagement at uh, Steve Stout's advertising agency, Translation. Over the course of his career, Marcus has developed an, a practice for creating culturally contagious ideas that inspire people to take action. His strategies and creative contributions have led to the launch and success of Google's Real Tone technology uh, and the, uh, the American Music Festival, the Brooklyn Nets, State Farm, Cliff Paolo campaign, and among others. Prior to his advertising tenure, Marcus began his career in music and tech with a startup he co-founded before working on iTunes Nike sports music initiatives at Apple and running digital strategy for none other than Beyonce. 
Uh, leading tonight's conversation is my colleague, Danielle Robinson-Bell, who's an assistant professor here in the Dill IMC and director of the IMC professional program. Her teaching and research is uh, focused on strategic communications with a lens on communities, culture, equity, and inclusion. Danielle spent more than 15 years on the agency side of advertising and branding, creating integrated marketing campaigns for some of the world's most recognized brands. She's a double alumna of Northwestern, having earned her BSJ from Medill and her MBA from Kellogg. Prior to joining Medill, Danielle was a trusted advisor to business leaders on matters related to crisis communications, public relations, reputation management, and inclusive communications. Danielle, I turn the proceedings over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dean Whitaker, as always, thank you for those wonderful introductions. Uh, before we get started, I would just like to say thank you to you all uh, for being here this evening and for braving um, this icky, icky weather uh, that we have tonight. So I don't take it lightly that you're here with us. Um, and I also would like to say hello and welcome to some friends uh, of our community who are joining us via the live stream. So hello to all of you there. Um, the way we're going to get into this topic tonight uh, is going to unfold in two parts. The first part, uh, you will hear from each of our guests. They will take the stage, they will share their thoughts um, as it relates to their work in this topic. And then we'll come back together and we will get into some things, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, and then we'll have some Q&A from the audience before we say goodbye. So with that, Marcus, sure. we'll start with you. Yes. So, I guess So, test. There is. All right. Hi, I'm Marcus. <laughs> hello. Thank you. Hey, there we go. It's just rude. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm really excited to be with you all this evening. Uh, so, thanks so much for 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 Brave and Weber and and, and and be with us. And I have a little bit of time to talk, and I want to share with you an idea called legitimation. And legitimation is this social process by which we decide collectively what's acceptable, what's in, what's out, what people like us do, ideas, behaviors, uh, uh, consumption patterns, why we do what we do. And we know this intuitively, it's just kind of a fancy name for it. Like for instance, you know, 20 years ago, if you wore uh, tattoos that were visible, you were a degenerate, right? Now it's totally acceptable. Uh, 20 years ago, if you wore sweatpants out in public, you given up on life. But now, it's totally acceptable, right? Have you ever seen an ad for Zoom? Never, right? But millions and millions of people use Zoom every day. Why is that? Because we collectively have decided that this is what people like us do. And it's this idea of legitimation that informs not only the things that we consume, the places that we go, the things that we are a part of, but also how we see the world and how we see people who are, represent themselves in the world through the stories that we tell. Right? We legitimate through the folklore that we tell from person to person, the things that we hear, the things that we say, through all the different media vehicles at our disposal. So for storytellers, this is a very powerful thing. Not only that, we have a great responsibility as storytellers based on the impact that our stories have on how people see the world. For instance, you know, if you're in a heterosexual cisgender relationship and you wanna propose to someone, you buy a diamond. Why? Because De Beers told us that. Right? De Beers told us to buy a diamond. And they said, diamonds are forever. They said that because actually diamonds are a terrible investment. Right? They, you try to resell a diamond, you won't be very happy. Right? But diamonds are forever. We're told to do this. We're told to save three months of our salary to, to, to show the one that we love that we love them. Right? But Nikki Eifelheimer, the, the past chairman of De Beers, says that diamonds are intrinsically worthless, except for the psychological need that they feel. How did we get here? Because of the stories that we were told and the stories that we told each other. And when this happened, right, when De Beers launched this Diamonds Are Forever campaign, the adoption of diamonds as a way that we propose shot through the roof. The same thing happened in Japan. The stories that we tell influence behavior. This is Superman powerful thing as you think about the people in this room who fashion themselves as storytellers. 
Marshall McLuhan says it best, that all media works us over completely. They're so pervasive in their personal, political, economic, aesthetic, psychological, moral, ethical, and social consequences that they leave no part of us untouched, unaffected, unaltered. They change the way we see the world, right? I mean, our perception of what beauty is is shaped, pardon the pun, by the stories that are told, right? The way we see people, like our public pedagogy, is shaped by the stories that we're told and the stories that we tell each other, right? Even what we think about gender roles are established by the stories that we tell and the stories that we tell each other, right? I have two daughters, Georgia, the eight-year-old, and Ivy, the three-year-old, and during COVID, I got a chance to watch their shows with them. That was kind of the benefit of that. I spent a lot of time watching the shows that they watch, and every show that my daughters watch, especially the eight-year-old, every female character was persuaded as a, was was, per, was presented as a princess. Some damsel in distress waiting for her to be rescued. And as I started to think back, I realized when we let Georgia pick her own Halloween costumes, they were all princesses. This is the first one. And I thought to myself, oh man, the year after that, she chose Princess Leia after I introduced her to Star Wars. She chose the princess. Now, Princess Leia was a bad A, but still... A princess nonetheless. Then the next year, she chose Princess Jasmine. Like this, her mind has been conditioned on what to aspire to because of the stories that she's been told. Now, last year I had enough and she went as Darth Vader. <laughs> enough of this, enough of this. Right? It's the stories that we tell. The stories that we tell help us decide what people like us do through the media that we consume the television, print, out of home radio, and the media of people. And that's a Superman powerful theme when we think about the discourse that we enter into on a day-to-day -day basis, in person, as well as the mediated technologies through zeros and ones. And this is a shameless plug. I wrote a book about this thing called For the Culture that goes deep into it, but we'll talk about that later. Thanks so much. Test, test, all right. Um, well, Marcus, I don't want you to have a conversation with my husband because I like my diamond. No, I'm, just, I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. Well, no, I'm not, but. <laughs> um, that was actually really uh, a phenomenal way. Um, and this is, I don't have as beautiful as a presentation. Um, Marcus is very clearly a professor. Um, but. I really think that was a great way and a great segue into what I want to talk about in terms of, Marcus, what you said about the stories that we tell. Um, and I think one of the beautiful things about the digital revolution is um, how we have influenced storytelling about ourselves um, and how social media actually has really shifted how we tell stories about uh, black and brown people particularly. I have a question. Um, has anybody, well, this is great weather to, to um, use this example. And, um, and so many people have been apologizing to me about the weather. I went to Northwestern for undergrad and grad school. This is just a very authentic experience. I feel like, you know, Northwestern's not done hazing me yet. So there we go. But great, great example. Has anybody been stuck at the airport? Had a bad experience with an airline? Um, missed a flight or dealt with poor service. Um, this happened a lot around the holidays. Anyone got on their phone and tweeted at the airline? Delta, how can you do this? I'm so upset, I can't believe this. And you, you tweeted that, right? And a lot of times that's because you can't get somebody on the phone, you can't get someone, you can't talk to somebody at the front desk, the line is too long, and you want to automatically let Delta, Southwest, JetBlue know, but also the world know that you're upset and that this brand failed you. Going back to the stories that we tell, as far as that brand is concerned, they would like for the general public to feel like this flight went really well, these people had no problem, but now here you are interrupting that by taking out your phone and tweeting that you're really upset about this experience. You now have taken ownership over the narrative. And that is quite frankly what we've been able to do, black and brown people, people of color, women, 
uh, queer folk have been able to kind of take back control over our stories. And social media has played such a huge role in that. Throughout my career, I have really had the honor of watching that happen in real time. Um, I, I oftentimes talk about, when I think about my time at the Huffington Post, um, covering the Trayvon Martin investigation, the George Zimmerman trial, the Michael Brown shooting in Ferguson, and the um, uh, protests thereafter, so much of the communication around that, and quite frankly, what is the origins of the Black Lives Matter movement happened at that time. And a lot of that information was disseminated through social media. So much of that information was disseminated through social media. So much of how activists um, communicated with each other was because of social media. We saw this, similar things happen during Black Lives Matter protests. Um, we saw similar things happen during George Floyd protests in uh, Minneapolis. Um, how we've communicated uh, Breonna Taylor, uh, the fact that uh, the officers were not held accountable in the Breonna Taylor murder, social media was very much rooted in that. Um, and that, again, kind of goes back to this idea that brands will have you think that flight went beautifully, right? Everyone got there on time, everyone landed safely, everything was wonderful. But we as individuals can take our phones out and say, that actually didn't happen. And that to me is the revolution, right? The revolution may be televised, but it'll also be tweeted, <laughs> you know? And I think that's really been the beautiful thing about social media, it's been about Twitter, it's been about Facebook, it's been about Instagram, is that we now can own our stories in so many different ways. I get this question a lot in terms of when I speak to students who say, how can I show that I have experience. How can I, I don't have an internship yet, I'm looking for an entry level job, how can I show that I have experience? And you know, when I was in school, we had, you could have a blog, um, you had internships. I talk a lot about the, the fact that, uh, you know, in order to break into journalism, there's a certain level of privilege that you have to have. Um, when I was a student, you had to take an unpaid internship. I think they've changed that now. I hope they have. Um, you had to take an inter in-paid internship. You had to live in an expensive city, New York, LA, metropolitan area. And, um, and that was how you got your experience. But one of the things that I found really incredible is the ownership that storytellers can take on their own platforms. Whether it's a YouTube channel or an Instagram or a TikTok, to be able to say, I've created this, I've built an audience, I've engaged with an audience, I've engaged with data, and I've responded to what my audience wants in real time. Because quite frankly, that's what I do every day as I run a media publication. I look at the data, I look at what my audience wants. That is extremely revolutionary, particularly when we think about black culture and black folks. Um, when I was at ESPN, they, it was a very um, stick to sports narrative, right? This was when Colin Kaepernick um, decided to kneel and uh, during the, the um, national anthem. And no one saw that happen, actually. No one saw that happen at first. And, um, hey, J.A. <laughs> and, um, and, and when, the, um, when there was actually attention brought to the fact that Colin, Ka Colin Kaepernick was kneeling during the national anthem, there was discourse on social media about you know, whether or not he was right, whether or not he was wrong. And you know, of course, you saw both sides kind of taking both of their, you know, sharing their opinions. And what I found, what I always found really fascinating was how much we were able to really own that narrative as black people, this idea, this stick to sports narrative. Because you have, you had athletes, you know, whether it was wearing I can't breathe shirts or whether it was pushing back at this narrative. But then you had a whole community on black Twitter supporting that and, and uh, really uh, rallying around that. Excuse me, I couldn't get that word. Rallying around that. So you then realize how much power the culture with a capital C has, right? One of the things that was um, 
really at the core of what we did at the Undefeated was how intrinsic race and culture was in sports. But again, a lot of brands, whether it's the NBA or the NFL, will have you think that's not the case, right? But think about how that has shifted based on the conversation that we're able to have and the accessibility we have to audiences because of social media. We have really very much changed that narrative. Owners will have you think, pre, you know, present like owners of 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 at, of sports companies or sports teams will have you think that rate that sports are the is the equalizer, right? It e, it evens the play in field, pun intended, right? We can be we can have different politics, but we can all root for the Bears, right? But when you give more access to the audience, that conversation shifts a little bit, right? When athletes can get on their social media platforms and they can talk about their own experiences, that narrative shifts a little bit. And that's, that started with Colin Kaepernick on the field and it kind of took off because of the conversation on social media. But sports is, again, the place where we're all supposed to come together, we're all supposed to be friends, we're all supposed to get along, but we started to realize that that's not really the case when you pull back the curtain a little bit. I always find it really fascinating when I watch, um, when I watch sports events and commercials now, I think there, I watched a commercial the other day and there was a 21 Savage song on the commercial. And I guarantee you, you know, the largely white executive operation of the NBA has no idea who 21 Savage is. But that has had to shift because of the digital revolution, because of the audience that actually engages with sports media. I think the Super Bowl is a great example of that. So uh, anybody watch the Super Bowl this past Sunday? Yeah, I'm sure. Did you watch the Super Bowl last year? Who performed last year? Great, there you go, all right. The year before that. And who performed this year? <laughs> it took you guys kind of a while. It was J-Lo and Shakira who performed the year before that. Do we know who performed the year before that? The weekend, yeah, there we go. What I find interesting is what all of those acts have in common, right? Um, and for a while, post Janet Jackson, Justin Timberlake, the Super Bowl really went in a different direction as far as its halftime show. And the numbers showed that. Um, I don't know if anybody has seen this yet, but um, Rihanna's halftime show actually outperformed the game. That's part of the digital revolution. That is a direct correlation to what people say they want to see. And to your point, Marcus, is this is the story we're being told, right? The story we're being told is that you sit down on Sunday, you watch the game, everybody's like, the big game, game day, you've got your game party, you've got your food, you've got everything. But what we actually found to be true was when people got on social media and they're, I'm bored, this sucks, I'm not watching this halftime show, this is whack. And then last year we heard, this is the best halftime show we've seen in the longest time, California, hip hop is representing. And then Rihanna gets on stage, pregnant, and shuts it down. It's like 100 feet in the air, right? And of course there was lots of discourse around how she performed, but we get to own how we interacted with that performance. We get to own that story. And so much of that is because of the conversation that we're able to have via black Twitter, right? And I, you know, I know we're gonna talk about this a little bit more, but I think black Twitter has been such an interesting force um, when we think about the word revolution um, and how black Twitter has really uncovered a lot of storytelling. Um, for me as an editor, I do 
reference social media very frequently um, to think through how the community is feeling, um, what stories aren't being told. Um, and I think that's really the thing about the word revolution, right? What's not being done and how are we making it such that we're paying attention to those things? Um, I find that social media really does point those things out and bring those things to light, particularly when it comes to telling black stories. Um, one thing that I've thought quite a lot, a lot about in my, in my role is how we think about black womanhood and who gets left out of that story. And oftentimes it is um, black trans women, black queer folk. And I go, went to Twitter, really, to, to really investigate that um, and to dig into that and to, um, to really see what was being said in the, amongst the zeitgeist, amongst the community. And I've been fascinated by, you know, just the way that we interact with each other. I think about things like um, Megan the Stallion and the Tory Lanez trial. Um, and, the, and the discourse and the conversation that was happening about black women and protecting black women and violence against black women and who gets to be protected and who doesn't get to be protected. And who owns that narrative and who doesn't? What I found that social media does is it has widened the scope of ownership, which has then um, widened the conversation. I think there's a lot of conversation about violence against black women that women that doesn't that doesn't oftentimes um, encompass trans women, and I find that conversation most interesting on social media. I say all of that to say that the revolution is being tweeted, it is being Instagrammed, it is on TikTok. I think about the wellness space um, 15, 20 years ago was very white, and how that really shifted with black women on social media saying that, you know, black women do yoga, black women do Pilates. Um, I think about, I, I consume a lot of content about gentle parenting. And a lot of that content is served to me by white women. And that's who gets the platform, right? But again, that platform has opened up so much because of social media. And the stories that we tell have opened up so much because of social media. That, in my experience, um, intrinsically relates to the data we look at in order to be successful. Traffic, how are we engaging with the audience? You can see that in you know, almost immediately. If we're doing something that doesn't resonate with our audience, we see that immediately. You can have this very, um, we can, I can post something on Instagram and get a comment of like, this is whack, boo, tomato, 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 right? That's the, that's the, the three tomatoes. And I'm like, okay, this isn't, this isn't what the community wants to hear. But for so long, that was such a one-sided conversation and such a one-sided door. And so, the revolution, I think, has very much taken place on social media. And we have, and brands have had to respond. Brands have had to respond to what is being said on social media. And so there is so much power in our little computer devices that we have, in our ability to say, actually, Delta, I had a really bad experience today, and I want everybody to know about it, and I want people to engage with me about it, and I want to have a whole thread where I'm going to talk about it, and someone else is going to add in their experience, and someone else is going to add in their experience, and eventually we're going to realize that there's a problem here, there's something missing here, and smart brands will respond to it, and there's so much power in that. And uh, I'm excited to talk more about it. It's not working. There it is. There we are. Give it a minute. So, so let's talk about yeah. it. Um, and I'm going to pick up a little bit where you left off. You mentioned brands. Circling back to the work that you do, um, not only as a professor, but also at uh, a really big <laughs> uh, agency, right? If... And I heard both of you say, when we think about narratives and the stories we tell, the power, right, how powerful that can be. 
especially when you, when you think about us owning, right, narratives, narratives especially around uh, black and brown people, right? So if you're a brand or if you are a media publication and if storytelling is this powerful and this influential, right, and this is at the heart of what you do because you're a media publication because you are a brand, then how do you think about, how should the brand, how should the media publication think about responsibility when it comes to this? And then accountability. Talk to us about that. Well, I don't think it's, it's not discussed enough. I mean, if we think about the sway, the influence that stories have, and we having a platform, as you mentioned, a broad platform to communicate on behalf of our brands, our entities, our organizations, then we, we bear a level of responsibility in what it means for people. For instance, um, I'm from Detroit, born and raised, holla. Um, and I grew up with a very specific relationship with the police. I loved the police as a kid. Why? Because they had uh, an uh, R&B band called the Blue Pigs. And they would come to my school and they'll play our, um, uh, Motown songs mixed with like the hottest R&B at the time, right? So you'll get like My Girl, then they'll go into Can You Stay in the Rain? It's like, I was like, I love the police, they're the best, right? And the stories I was told as a child was that the police are here to serve, to protect you. And that was the, the narrative that was played in my mind. That was the legitimation that I had built in my mind on what the police were until I started seeing other stories like Malice Green, right? Uh, like Rodney King, and of course, most recently, uh, George Floyd, or in every other instance we see. And I realized that, wait a minute, that story is not akin to the stories that I see here. So the stories I've been, to been told from my parents, from the institution that was the police, those things are not analogous to what I see. And if you look at the first iteration, like the etymology, not the etymology, but the origins of the police, that they were meant to police slaves in this country. Like that's what the institution was built to do. So if you can see how the stories that are tell could take something as malicious as the origins of the police to one to being to protect and serve, so then we as storytellers, particularly marketers, we have a unbelievable responsibility to take accountability for the things that we put in the world and what it means to the people who consume it. Um, wow, uh, the blue pigs, that's fascinating. Yeah, so uh, hot. <laughs> they were hot in the streets, they were. Um, you know, I think as a media company, we have an obligation to tell the truth, right? And um, I think that we, oftentimes have to get educated about what the truth is and whose truth we're telling. And um, you have to do the work uh, and the reporting, quite frankly, I think, of, of making sure that you have left no stone unturned and, and you're telling uh, an honest and truthful story. And you know, when you think about accountability, again, I do think that social media does hold brands accountable, I think it holds media publications accountable, I think it holds any, anyone in a position of power um, accountable because it has really uh, created sort of a level of accessibility that we didn't have before. Um, and so when I think about what our obligation is, you, you know, I think our obligation, I think when I think about who my audience is, I think I have an obligation to tell to make sure that I'm communicating that I see them fully. And, um, and I think that that is what helps me then um, remain accountable to them, right? Like if I, if I put a story out and someone's like, oh, well, what about this angle? Or you left this out or you didn't think about this. I have to ask myself that question. Like, did we, you know, did we leave that out or did we just tell one one side of this perspective? Did we only give one, um, one view on this issue? Uh, it is kind of, you know, what I think about when I think about like, how are we communicating uh, black womanhood? How are we communicating black relationships? You know, um, am I only thinking of a heterogender, cis, cis, cisgender, um, excuse me, heterosexual cisgender relationships? I do think that, um, 
the particularly in digital media, um, social commentary, whatever it might be, plays a really big role in holding publications accountable and pointing out any of the holes. Um, I think we have, and, and that makes the obligation that much stronger, in my opinion. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with editors who, I won't say live in fear, but are very aware of how it will be received as soon as the story gets posted, right? And I think there's something really powerful to that, you know? Now, I think we have an obligation as members of the media to, you're not, I don't think we ne necessarily just need to be led by trolls on Twitter, right? Um, so I do think we have an obligation as members of the media to do the work and to do the reporting and to make sure that we feel like the reporting is sound. But I think we also need to listen. We need to have a conversation with our audience rather than just talking at our audience. I often say that audiences, true, want to be seen, but more than that, they want to feel valued, right? Um, so let's back up a little bit. Marcus, you, as uh, you mentioned, and as it was said in your bio, you are a professor. You are head of strategy at Wyden and Kennedy. In a few months, you have a book coming out. So you've done, and you've been in this space for a while. Right, I heard um, earlier today he had an audience with our full-time IMC students and he shared a little bit about his, uh, his journey. You've been in this space for a while. You've seen a lot. You've worked with a lot of brands and your career actually started in entertainment. So from where you sit in this space, we're talking about storytelling and, and culture, right? What surprises you the most? I think what gets my attention the most, and I'm not, I guess I'm not surprised because I know it, but what gets my attention the most is just how specific we are about the cultural characteristics. And when you are a part of a community, the slightest little infraction on what is considered normal, people can see it 10,000 miles away. And, and, I, and, I, and it's interesting working with brands who want to be a part of the culture. Like, you know, we want to be a part of hip hop or we want to do this, what are skaters doing and what's going on in gaming? And they have a want to be close, but there's no proximity, right? There's no intimacy. And I, and I find it uh, uh, amusing to see them misstep. But how do you get closer, become more intimate? Yeah, it requires closer. radical empathy. I like the way Danielle put it, this idea of being accountable, that is realizing that people are going to see things differently the way you do, right? Things aren't the way they are. They are the way that we are, right? That is, for some, a cow is leather. For others, it's a deity. And for some, it's dinner. And it's the same thing. It's not objective. So realizing that people see the world differently than you do, it requires putting on the lenses of other people as we look at how we put things in the world. And I think that brands, I mean, you know, not to throw shade, but you think about Pepsi and the, the Kendall Jenner ad from years ago. In my mind, they were not in that boardroom saying, how do we offend as many people as possible? Like, I don't believe that their intentions were, were bad. I don't think that there was any ma maliciousness there. They just didn't have close proximity to how people would perceive that. Right, we see the same thing in journalism, right? When the framing is wrong, right? Like, you have to be able to see the world through the eyes of other people, and that requires tremendous empathy. And that's how we get close to people, by removing ourselves, denying ourselves in a lot of ways, and seeing the world through the eyes of people and how they make meaning. I mean, that's what culture is. It is a meaning-making system. So to understand people's culture requires understanding how they make meaning. So I'm gonna go a little bit deeper. Yeah, right? let's do it. So let's get very practical, okay. tactical, yes. right? Is it, if I'm a brand, is it I'm hiring an agency like the ones you've worked for yep. in the past? Is it that I am bringing someone onto my team who can come into the boardroom and yep. help me bridge that gap? If I'm trying to make a decision on whether to run this Pepsi spot with yep. Kendall Jenner. Right? Is it that I, as the decision maker, need to you know, go to a certain community and experience the purchase, um, the path to purchase for myself? What, what is it? All of the above. I think it requires, you, you can't outsource intimacy. 
You can't say, hey, Danielle, go talk to them people and you tell me what, what, what they say, then I do the thing. It's like you have to go talk to people yourself. Right? You have to go invest yourself in it. So, yes, you get an agency like Wyden Kennedy to provide perspective that you don't have. Great. And we go out and we invest ourselves in the cultural, cultural context as to where these people live, breathe, and live out their lives. And we go, oh, this is how they behave. This is how they see the world. This is what they believe. This is what their artifacts mean, what their behaviors are normative. And then we take that back and say, okay, considering what we found about these people, here's where the brand can interact. And then we share that with the client. And the idea is like bringing them along on the journey. But if clients really want to know, you come out there with us. Come, come do the ethnographies with us. Come shake people's hands, look at people in the eyes, and see them not as consumers, not as machines that eat messages and crap cash, but see them as real life human beings that navigate the world through their cultural, their, their, their cultural governance. And then... Sure, have people in the room who understand those people. If they're from that community, awesome, even better. But ultimately what you want is people who are willing to invest themselves in the, the walks of lives that aren't their own. I like that. Can I add that I think Please. that that is, that's the beauty of storytelling and I think that that is the superpower that journalists and storytellers can have for brands. I think that is why editorial storytelling is oftentimes so important for brands. That actual authentic storytelling that doesn't feel like an ad, that doesn't feel like a commercial, that actually feels like it's entrenched in the community and authentically and organically part of the community is so much more um, productive and just does a much better job of, of moving of, of of getting of getting that engagement i mean i think it's oftentimes why we look forward to like super bowl commercials right because they're so much smarter they seem like they just we engage with them so differently they're not they they they're funny they're clever they're so they they seem so much like so much more went into them and i do think that those are the worlds where journalism and marketing can really fuse and meet really beautifully. And I think the brands that do the best job understand that. That's a really great point about the Super Bowl because here's the moment where, the biggest media moment in the country, where a third of the country are watching a program. And the idea is that people get to see themselves in the game, right? Like I remember watching the what's up ads from back in the day. And like me and my friends used to do that. And it's like, that, yo, Steve, this is what we do, son. This is so great. Look at us. Right? And, it's, and, and it's, it's a rare moment, especially if you're from marginalized communities, especially if you're black and you're people of color where everyone's watching the game and you're like, that's me. Like, to be seen is powerful. And that's what stories provide. Right? When you, you go and you consume any cultural product, be it a movie, a television show, a podcast, while you're consuming it, you're putting yourself in that situation, and stories have this unbelievable power to invite you in and allow you to see yourself, no matter how specific the story may be about that person, we're able to transfix ourselves into it. And good marketers, we don't call ourselves advertisers. We call ourselves storytellers when we're at our best because that's the power of stories. And the expectation at Super Bowl is that, oh, you better come with it. Right. And I better be able to see myself in it. If not, Whack. Right, 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 right. Right. So, so Danielle, in your new role at Essence, congratulations. Congrats. By the way, yeah, that's, that's so huge. Great. Yes, 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 yes. In your uh, one of your recent editor's letters, right, you talk about um, the some of the things that you would like to bring to uh, Essence. Yeah into storytelling, right, especially as it relates to black women. And by the way, Essence Magazine, when you think about uh, black women and black women in media and how they're portrayed in media and stories for black women, it doesn't get any bigger or more iconic than Essence Magazine, which Danielle reads. Um, so, but in your editor's letter, you talk about wanting to change the status quo. So we've been talking about storytelling and narratives and owning it and it's powerful and what have you. What are, how do we think about changing narratives? Yeah, um, 
Marcus, I love what you just said about how powerful it is when people feel seen. Uh, when I got to Essence, the first issue that I was charged with pulling together was the black love issue. And um, that felt like, hey, just a really beautiful issue to start with, but it was, you know, it was our January, February issue. So it was like, okay, let's set the tone for the year. And, um, you know, the past issues um, of Essence, the black love issues of Essence have had, um, you know, beautiful black couples and families on it. Um, and the first time uh, Niecy Nash and Jessica Betts were um, on the cover um, full of last year's 2022 black love issue. And it was really a historical cover. It was the same time a same sex couple had been on the cover of Essence Magazine, um, which was a huge moment. And so I am competitive and I put a lot of pressure on myself. So my first question was, how do I beat that, right? <laughs> um, and, that, and that's hard, it's hard to. And one of the things I thought to myself was, what about the black women who aren't coupled? And what about the black women who are single and who aren't lacking love in any way because of that? And so I decided I wanted to put a single woman on the black love, on the cover of the black love issue. And a lot of that was because I wanted people to feel seen. Um, I think Essence has always done an incredible job of being sort of this aspirational beacon in our community, um, of being very respectable, and this is how we are supposed to present as black people and as black women. And I think that being in a relationship is part of that. But the reality is that there are a lot of black women who are single and who are happy and who love themselves. And so I wanted to redefine how we talk about black love. And um, and talking about self-love, right? And talking about just owning, loving yourself and what that experience is like. I felt like that would resonate with so many more women than seeing a couple on the cover. But mm -hmm. don't black women deserve... Love, Absolutely. and, I, and I'm, I'm quoting what I've yeah. seen Absolutely. on Twitter. Absolutely. Whenever um, an image comes across or a, a, gets tweeted out or a brand, um, you know, includes any sort of visual or narrative, uh, right, that, yeah. that, um, that involves a uh, black woman, whether she's caring for family or whether she's... Uh, by herself mm -hmm. and maybe um, uh, portraying, you know, self-love or sure. symbolizing self-love or what have you. There are there is a chorus, yep. right? Yep. Of why are we always? Did I say we identify as a black woman? You know, why are we always portrayed mm -hmm. as being uncoupled, unloved? Sure. Sure. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Your yeah. To that. I mean, so my response to that, well, for Essence specifically, I do actually think Essence for the black love issue does portray black love, it, heterosexual, uh, cisgender, um, with the exception of Niecy Nash and Jessica Betts. What was important, so it was important to me to, to communicate that on the cover. Now throughout the book, throughout the issue, and I talked about this in my editor's letter, was I wanted to think of black love in so many different ways. So black women do deserve love. Black women deserve self-love. Black women deserve romantic love. Black women deserve familial love. Um, one of the, we had a personal essay in the piece um, from a black queer writer about the complicated nature of mourning family members who did not accept her identity. And so talking about the familial love in the black community, talking about um, platonic love, love between friends. The, uh, I think the New York Times wellness section did, did this incredible piece about what actually happens to our brains when we fall in love with friends. So there's so many different types of ways we can talk about love. And what I feel like Essence has always done is we've always talking about, spoken about it in a romantic, hetero, heteronormative way. And I wanted to shift that. Um, but I wanted to expand it. I don't want to change it. 
I want to expand it. I want to make room for more because as we evolve as black people, as black women, we can have a larger conversation. And so that was really what I wanted to do was push the status quo a little bit and say, yes, it's wonderful to see all these incredible couples on the cover of Essence and you know that aspirational love, one day I'll get married too and that'll be me, but here's who I am today and Essence is reflecting and seeing me today. When it comes to uh, black and brown stories and narratives, what are some of the ones that do need to be expanded upon? Both of you. I feel really strongly about, um, about black queer stories. Um, I feel very, very strongly about it. Um, and I think when, you know, when we were talking about diverse storytelling, it's really important to me to have diverse perspectives in the room. Um, I don't, you know, I feel this way about every place I've ever worked has always been like, I get that email on January 1st, like, hey, Danielle, what are we doing for Black History Month, right? Everywhere I've ever worked, everywhere. Hey, Danielle, can you share out the editorial plan for Black History Month? I feel like similarly it happens like pride, right, is coming. And it's like, who's going to be on the cover for June because we've got to, it's got to be, we've got to do something for Pride Month. And I feel really strongly about the fact that we, do, that we just don't box those things in to Black History Month and Pride and uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. At, like, we can tell you stories every day. But Marcus's clients <laughs> only have a budget <laughs> for these things. I that's that's for, the pro for, that's problematic. In February and June. And, and it's, it's super that's problematic. That's where the money's coming, yeah, money's coming 1, in. Yeah, that's where the money's coming in. 1,000%. I mean, I think that for me, what needs to be expanded is what it means to be black. You know, it's like we, we put people in a box, not because it's real, but because it's easy, right? And black people aren't a model. Like, we know this intuitively, but when I'm with my clients, it's like, hey, here's the spot. Now, how do we make it for the black people? And how do we make it for the Hispanic people? As if you know, these people are, are one in the same, or these people, that everyone within this population is the same, and they're not. So expanding what it means to be black, the, the, the diversity in the diaspora, I think it's super important. And what I love how you talk about the work you're doing with Essence, Danielle, is that you're telling stories, not really as a storyteller, more as a story starter. Mm -hmm. They're like you're starting the story to invite people to enter the discourse, mm -hmm. right? And weigh in, because I mean, this is what legitimation is. It's like Essence doesn't, I define what things are. Essence starts the conversation from a place of authority, from a place of credence to allow people to say, okay, here's how I see it. And collectively we decide to say, okay, they're invited to the cookout. Okay, we're cool to do this. Okay, that, 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 that's cool with us. And I think that the, that is the responsibility of storytellers today, that we start stories from a place of authority and credence, well-researched, well-factualized, well and invite people into it so that we can expand our perspectives as they currently are. Sticking with you for a second, can we talk about Beyonce? <laughs> is, is now the time that we, it is for me. So <laughs> um, you wrote recently in Ad Week, um, maybe it was last fall, um, that there's a difference in your mind um, between pur a purpose-driven brand and to be conviction driven. And this is something that, first of all, please explain the difference, but and also how you feel Beyonce uh, illustrates that difference well. And then the next question is, what tour stop are we going to? The Renaissance <laughs> tour. So maybe someone, I know someone I know. out there got a cold. <laughs> I'm so, going to Houston so <laughs> um, the, my birthday weekend. Nice. I'm pumped, thanks. So I, I was thinking about this a lot because there's so much conversation within our industry about purpose-driven brands. What is the purpose? Purpose-driven brands. And I thought it was kind of a crazy and sort of self, uh, a self-expressed thought 
then of course brands have purposes. Like brands are signifiers that conjure up thoughts and feelings on behalf of companies, products, people, and institutions. So therefore their purpose is to conjure thoughts and feelings, of course. But that's not what we're asking here. What we're asking is what do brands believe? What's their conviction? How do they see the world? Right? What are the frames by which they make meaning of the world? And I use Beyonce as an example because I worked for her and I think that she's awesome. But Beyonce's conviction has been clear since the moment we met her in 97 where she said, no, 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 no. I mean, everything about Beyonce has been always about women's empowerment, full stop. Whether it was pay my bills, to the left, get information, who runs the world, or now, you know, you ain't gonna break my soul. Everything about Beyonce has been about conviction. And there's a lot that we can learn from that about brands. That if we are convicted as a brand, whether you're a CPG company, QSR, et cetera, then it becomes very clear the kind of stories that we tell and for whom we tell these stories and for whom we serve and for whom we have an obligation to help. But brands who are quote unquote chasing purpose, I think it gets lost in what you actually believe. We chase what do we mean by purpose and as opposed to what do we mean by conviction? What are we convicted for and to do? Essence has a very clear conviction and it guides all your editorial, right? Brands should be equally convicted in the stories that we tell that guides all of our editorial, not only what we say, what we do, and the products that we put in the world. Then why do so many brands, should say so many, why do some brands misstep when it comes to stories, oh, especially around race and culture? Because no one wants to be convicted. I mean, conviction, it takes a lot to be convicted. Right? That means I'm going to stand for this even if I'm the only one. And, and for someone to do that, that, it can be alienating. No one wants to take that risk because I want to sell to everybody. And if we look at the brands that are the most beloved, revered when it comes to this, they take very clear stances. Patagonia is the perfect example of this. Patagonia has a very clear belief and it stands for it. And if you don't like it, don't buy the coat. All good. Like, and, and it's that level of conviction that is scary, but also empowering, right? That's why we love people who keep it real. We love, we love them because we wish we could be that brave. I, I think there's definitely that power and hyper-focus. Like, I always think of Subaru commercials. Absolutely. Subaru knows its audience. Like, I am not the Subaru driver, but when I watch those commercials, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> these people love dogs, and they love them. The nature and they want a long lasting vehicle. If you think about a Subaru commercial, there's that commercial where like he has the same car through the dog's like whole life. Right, right. And you're like, yes. I Not want me, but, but yes right. for you. <laughs> but for you, you should I get it. Like I I'm a Toyota driver, but I get you and your Subaru love. But I think there's something so powerful to being hyper focused. I think some of the most successful brands, the most successful stories have had a hyper focus. I was just talking about this earlier. The brilliance to me of the 1619 Project is the thesis that no one has a stronger claim to the American dream and to the American flag than black American people. That is a hyper focused thesis. And the way that the 1619 Project then um, comes to be beyond that is beautiful just, just based on that one thesis statement. And so I think when you have that hyper focus, when you really understand who your audience is, when you really understand who your mission is, I think about a show like Insecure. I would watch Insecure. There was, I remember there was one time I was watching it and they were in like a, they were in like an art gallery or at a show. And the show would show on Sundays. Friday night, I had been at an art gallery with friends. And so it was like, oh my gosh, this is my life. Yeah. And it's so powerful when you're hyper-focused on your audience and you're hyper-focused on that story. When people really see themselves like that, it's incredibly powerful. It's actually, I think, more impactful than when you cast a wide net. You catch way more fish when you're hyper-focused than you do when you just throw the net out into the, into the ocean. 
And so, Marcus, your comments and, and Danielle together reminds me of something that I talk about with my, my colleague Jacqueline Babb here when we, when we talk about purpose and brands and this idea of values over everything, right? And so when I hear you talk about being conviction-driven, right, um, it reminds me of, of that sentiment, right? The brands who tend to misstep less or not at all, right, are very clear about values over everything and conviction, being conviction driven, okay? Well, I, th I would also say I think sometimes when brands do misstep, it is because they're clumsily trying to cast that right, wide net. Um, and so I think the desire is, there's a value proposition in the audience, right? So the desire is to reach the audience, but they're doing it clumsily. They're not really doing it with that conviction or that hyper-focus. They well, need markets. Well, to, to your point about journalism, just as journalists get put in check by the people, so do brands. Yeah. Like you come out playing yourself, you go, mm-mm, yeah. nah, fail, nah, it's not gonna I work. mean, how many times have we seen those like weird tweets that like, you're like, oh God, who did, please take, don't look, like Burger King, please don't do that, you know? <laughs> Okay. So speaking no of Twitter, shade to Burger King. Speaking, speaking of Twitter, Burger King comes up a lot in our ISC <laughs> courses. But speaking of Twitter, right, and Black Twitter in particular, do you have a favorite Black Twitter moment? That's so hard. While you, while you think about it, I'll tell you. Speaking of the Super Bowl and Rihanna, um, what made me giggle so hard uh, were some of the the tweets, and not just on Twitter, but we've got. TikTok talk and, mm -hmm. and everything, but <laughs> this idea that how dare they have a football game right. before and right. after right. the Rihanna, the Rihanna concert. concert. Right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> so. I'll tell you my favorite phrase. My favorite phrase is, how are you going to get on Blue Ivy's internet? <laughs> right. <laughs> Not right. on Blue Ivy's right. internet. I love it. I love it. Um, I think one of my favorite, what I actually found really fascinating um, was when during the pandemic during when versus was really was became a thing versus what happened and to versus yeah versus is kind of you know we we back outside so we're not we don't need versus anymore um i thought versus was so fat it was fascinating to me this the the evolution of it how it started on like ig live and like folks didn't know how to use it and <laughs> And, Teddy Riley. And, and, so that's, <laughs> and, and it was, I remember, I remember during the pandemic, I would put verses on, I was singing the songs when it was Babyface and Teddy Riley, and how mad everybody was when Teddy Riley came through t trying to do too much, right? Sure. Because verses was just like bare bones, take your phone, play some songs, let us rock out a little bit in our individual apartments and houses and, and homes. And no. you came with speakers <laughs> and a DJ and a hype man and was black Twitter thing. was not having it. And it was such a, it was, it's interesting given the fact that versus, I think the last versus was like in um, Madison Square Garden. I was Garden. just about to say, how far <laughs> like, have we how come, far right? Have come. <laughs> but in the beginning, it was just like, dog, just get your, just play, play just, just, just get your, <laughs> you know, just play the music and talk, give us a little bit of background, but let us just enjoy the music. And I do think that black Twitter moment, how mad black Twitter was at Teddy Riley for like ruining, we had been looking Became forward to, I mean, if you take yourself back then. You know, like this. Right. If you take yourself back to that moment, like it was like, we, you were looking forward to verses because it's like, what else were we doing? I could do a second one. They had to do a second one. <laughs> we'll be and back. I, and let me tell you, I was mad. I'm a big Babyface fan. So I was ready to rock out, and Teddy Riley ruined my night. And, and Black Twitter let Teddy Riley and his hype man know, like, please take your speakers and your DJ somewhere else. And that was the thing about D-Nice, right? Like, D-Nice just got on IG Live and just, just did his thing. And it was so simple, and it was so just bare bones and lovely, and I love that Black Twitter was like, don't come with all that. Just give us the music. I mean, black people, black Twitter is the conscious of the predominant black culture. Yeah. And that's really, really powerful as we talk about this idea of keeping people, uh, make holding people accountable. That the, the, the technology that we have today allows for the conscious to decide what's acceptable and what isn't. Yeah. And when you are out of line, you get fried. You get fried. You get, but that's what's so beautiful about exactly. social because for so long we didn't have that. Like brands and 
editors live in fear of black Twitter. Like sometimes people are like, oh, what is black Twitter gonna say? I was just about to ask Marcus, is this, did this come up in any, did it, does it come up in your conversations with clients? I mean, absolutely. They're like, hey, are we gonna get in trouble for this? Right. Are people gonna come at us for this? Like, are they gonna get dragged for this? Sometimes, maybe. <laughs> yeah. and, and, but the thing is, that's the truth or the case for everything. Yeah. I mean, anytime that you, you can have 500 followers and you post something filed and someone picks it up, yeah. you're gonna get fried. fried. And, and I think that, like, that is the power of, of, of social. Right. That's the power of, of people that we collectively decide what's acceptable and what isn't. And think about how that has shifted the narrative and the storytelling, right? So even the fact that that conversation is happening now shifts how the story is told. This, this concern, like, are we gonna get dragged? Are we gonna get fried? So then there's a challenge to do it better, do a better job, tell a better story, tell a more thorough, holistic, do more reporting. Make sure you ask another question, get one more source so that you don't get dragged. It really does change the way we tell stories. It, okay, so then that is a lot yeah. of response and reaction to a group of people on a social media platform who may or may not be one of your audience members or one of your key stakeholders, yeah. right? If you're a brand, you wanna pull the product because black Twitter said you did a thing wrong? Do we know if, if, this, if, this, um, if this backlash, right? Do we know who's yeah. behind it for real? And, and where I'm going with this or what sort of, <laughs> I've been thinking about this question for a really long time because back in June, I forget if it was this June or last June, but Juneteenth in the Walmart ice cream, right? Mm -hmm. And they came out with a statement. They pulled some of the product. But my biggest question was the ones who were so upset about it, were they Walmart shoppers? Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose that's the power of culture in that... People don't live in isolation, like I'm a Walmart shopper. Well, no, I'm also a part of this family. I'm a part of this fraternity. I'm a part of these communities. And what they think influences my behavior, right? So if I would say it was fine with me, but if everybody else hated it, I guess I'm not doing that either. And that's, that governs our behavior. So while black Twitter may not be your target, they're definitely going to influence the people that are around them. And, and I think where that sort of differentiates for uh, publications is, again, really, you have to know who your audience is. Um, this used to happen for us at The Undefeated. This has happened, at, honestly, everywhere I worked. At Huffington Post, when we, one of the, you always wanted to get your story on the AOL homepage because you would get a ton of traffic, ton of traffic. But you also had to do that with the understanding that 90% of the people who are going to the, I mean, I'm talking about AOL, you've got mail homepage. Like I'm not, like this is old school, like dial up, like the homepage that comes up on AOL. That audience was very different from the Black Voices audience. And I always knew as soon as I got that email, hey Danielle, we're gonna take this story over the homepage. I would literally brace myself for the racist, vitriolic, awful emails that we would then get because that audience was not our audience. And so, you know, we, I think you have to differentiate between the same thing would happen at the undefeated when it got on the ESPN homepage, we would get comments and we would get, well, we didn't have comments, thank God. Uh, we didn't have comments because of my experience at HuffPost, but we would get emails, we would get tweets, again, kind of racist, and um, vitriolic, but you have to know who your audience is then. So I think that is the difference um, oftentimes journalistically or for particular publications, depending on who your audience is, of course. Um, you have to be really, you have to understand who you're speaking to and who you're uh, telling stories for. 
um, because that could be really, really different. And you can get that reach and you can get that traffic, but you might not just be reading, reaching the audience that you're hoping to reach. Right, right, right. So I have two last questions, and then we'll move to some Q&A from the audience. So get your questions ready, right? Uh, first question uh, is about us here at Medill. Right? So we are teaching and inspiring the next generation of storytellers in both media and marketing. And if we do this well, each of you, what will be the impact of our future alumni in this space? Well, I'm so biased. <laughs> Northwestern has all my money. Um, and I, I genuinely think that Medill alum are some of the most incredible members of the media. Really, really. I genuinely think that. Um, my little sister went to Mizzou. I told her she made the wrong decision. Um, I'm still mad about it. I think what I have found, so I, I say this all the time whenever I meet students, I'm, I say, put in the subject that you're a Medill student or that you, we connected at Medill. Um, my inbox is horrific, but if I see Medill in my inbox, I will stop and open the email. I think that um, Medill prepares you for the future of journalism, sometimes without even knowing what the future of journalism is. And I think that is the most impactful thing about this program um, and this institution. Um, I remember I've called Charles before almost every job I've ever taken. And I think what Charles has always challenged me to think about is where is this publication going? What is this, what's next for this company? Um, and I think that graduates of this university, of this program are, are poised for the future in ways that nobody else is. Um, it's really an ever-changing industry. And, um, you know, I think about what journalism was when I was a freshman to when I graduated undergrad to when I graduated um, and got my master's. It was so different every time. And what it looks like now, it was so different every time. But I've always felt so uniquely prepared for that. I've reached into, you know, the, I've reached back into my mind and, and gone back to classes that I was in. I've gone back to Karen Springen's class in my mind. I've gone back to Charles's class in my mind. I was telling Charles how I worked in digital media for the last 10 years. I wasn't actually ever expecting to work in print. And so now I, here I find myself right in the green room looking at layouts and hearing Charles like, this dangling widow at the end of this, <laughs> get rid of this. And so, you know, preparing myself for my future in ways that I didn't even know were possible. I thought I was walking away from magazine forever. Um, and so when I think about where the industry has gone, I do feel like Medill graduates are, are poised to face whatever comes their way. And I think that's a level of excellence that very few other schools equip their students with. Right. Marcus, for the future CMOs that, are, that we're putting out into the world. I think that there will be, uh, if we do this right, mm -hmm. if you all do this right, there'll be more voices, more diverse stories, better representation, and people will feel seen if we do this right. And I think that, uh, Every professor in this building has a responsibility to do that, right? right? Yep. Last question, and then we're coming to Q&A. Finish this sentence. I'm black, and I'm? Here for it. <laughs> black, and I'm here for it, for all of it. I'm black, and I'm thriving. Thriving. Uh, my hometown is Augusta, Georgia also home to James Brown, so I'm black and I'm proud. So there you go. Um, all right, uh, that concludes this part of our program. Thank you both so much. Can we get a round of applause for our wonderful guests? <laughs> Questions? Uh, 
I think you'll agree that journalists are storytellers. Do you think journalists ought to be activists? Um, I answered this. I actually had a similar conversation earlier today. I think that um, journalism done right is a form of activism. Um, I think that when you lay out the facts, you don't really have to say much. Trust your reader, trust your audience. Lay out the facts, everything, give them everything. And you don't have to get on a megaphone and say, this is not right. You don't have to hit people over the head with it. Just lay out the facts. Let your reporting do the work. Their journalism is a form of activism when done correctly. Some of the most powerful stories I've read, um, I've edited in my career, I've written, I think if you, when the reporting has been done, they've really moved the needle in a powerful way. Um, I've read some of the John Bartlow Award finalists and I've walked away from those stories just really moved. I remember there was a story about homelessness um, that just moved me. And not because it was saying, this is, you know, what's happening in these cities is terrible, um, but it was just the facts. I think if you just lay out the facts, you, people will walk away from it and do their own form of, organ, or of activism based on the information you shared with them. Next question. This may be more of a comment, but I'm wondering what are your thoughts about the sacredness of black American culture in terms of the online media, in the sense of a lot of language is quickly being appropriated, used, and disseminated online, and then also in real life. And how this is not necessarily a new phenomenon, but it's uh, coming at a quicker space. And how, as black people, do we own our culture while it's also being used to make money from us? And that our culture is sometimes the only thing that we do own, but we don't even make the most money off of it. That is a great question. It's a very heavy question and an important question. And this is the challenge of culture, particularly cultural production, right? Once you express the cultural characteristics, the beliefs and ideologies of your people, through a consumable product, television, print, uh, uh, podcast, uh, uh, brands, branded products, music, literature, dance, these things are now consumable by people outside of yourself, right? You release it to, to the public and therefore it is available for public consumption. Now for it to be reworked and assigned new meaning, that is cultural appropriation. Now, cultural appreciation is why we do it to the public as opposed to whispering it to our friends. We spread it to everyone so that A, people feel seen, but also that culture could be shared as it should be. But it requires a level of respect and a level of, of understanding that we don't have. So when it comes to how do we keep our culture sacred, well, it requires our peers, the people around us, to respect it. And, and, and the technology available to us allow these things to spread faster than, than ever before. Like that's what technology does. Like it, it, it accelerates things that we already do. So I think the real question or the real sort of provocation is to ask our peers, respect us. Next question. Question down. No, 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 there's a mic coming. Um, well, thank you all for joining us. Um, I wanted to ask uh, if you could elaborate more on um, the conviction-driven um, perspective, because I, I just wanted to ask if there's this conviction-driven or having that mindset look the same for everybody, is it different for everybody, or can you find the balance of maybe not having the same um, driven mindset as Beyonce, but also Danielle, you were talking about how some companies, you know, clumsily get into casting that wide net and you don't want to get there. Or 
you know, does it look different? What can that, um, yeah, that's. Sure, like the, the conviction is what Simon Sink refers to as the why. I had to see the world, right? So our, our, our agency was founded with Nike 42 years ago. And Nike believes that every human body is an athlete. And Nike's been preaching that gospel for 42 plus years. Now, the way they communicate it has changed because culture changes, right? Con the context in which they communicate it has changed, but the core conviction has stayed the same, right? Nike 40 years ago is the same Nike today to just show up differently with the same conviction. Uh, Coke believes in, in optimism. They've been telling us that since, I want to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. Coke told us to open happiness. You go, yeah, Coke definitely do that, right? And Coke just so happens to be bubbly sugar water. It's soda. That's what they do. But it's why they do it that we, we invest so much meaning into it. So the point is your why should just be yours. It's not based on my why. It's based on your conviction. So long as it's true. So long as it's real. So long as it's authentic. Because that's what's going to govern how you show up in the world from here on out. A couple of questions here and then uh, over here. Oh. Thank you so much for being here. So good to see you all, especially Danielle. So nice to see you. I, I have a question about this tension between um, the prolifer pro proliferation of social media and how it certainly can have an impact on editors and their decisions, but also the impact on cancel culture. Mm -hmm. Because I'm one to believe that often these editors, instead of really doing more work, they may say, I don't want to do this story at all. And so it has a chilling effect on some of the subject matters they tackle. So I'm wondering if either of you would comment on that in the, in the storytelling vein. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, um, I, I experienced that a lot. And I think that was why my response, Marcus, when we were speaking earlier was, how it impacts the story, the way we tell the story. I'm of the mind that it shouldn't impact whether or not you tell the story. It should impact how you tell the story. That's what I actually think is so powerful about social media and just the overall access that we have to the audience that we didn't have before. You know, I think we used to be able to put a product out, print product, and you know, I think about newspapers getting delivered to folks doors and then you you didn't really know what happened, how people received it. Um, you know, you could write a letter to the editor or something like that, but you weren't getting that sort of quick response that you get in the way you do now. But I don't think that that should change whether or not you do a story. It should change how you tackle the story. Again, like make an extra call, get another source, Argue with yourself, argue with that person on Twitter and push yourself to do a better job. Don't actually, don't talk to, the, don't feed the trolls. But I would just, I, I say that to my writers all the time, like please don't feed the trolls, but have, let that help inform the way you tell your story. And, you know, understand that there's, you know, that they, that might be calling out a void in your piece, but that that shouldn't deter you from doing the piece. Um, and so I think that what I find really interesting, particularly about the digital rev revolution, um, is that it has changed the way we've told stories. It has made us a bit more accountable. It has um, sort of pulled back the curtain. Um, and I think the best writers and editors lean into that challenge and make their story better you know, and challenge themselves to say, oh, I didn't think of that perspective. Let me, let me add that in there. Let me do some research. Let me read a little bit more and add that perspective in there rather than being, you know, rather than being afraid to do it. Um, you know, cancel culture, I think, is an interesting phenomenon that has come of social media. I think we've given people less latitude to make mistakes and fail. Um, you know, I think there's a difference between calling people out and calling people in. I think social media is a very difficult place to do that. There's just not enough real estate to have some of those conversations. Uh, and so I particularly get frustrated by 
the our proclivity to kind of use social media to have conversations that quite frankly can't happen on social media. But I do think that as at least journalistically, that challenge opens up an opportunity to make your story better, to do a better job and te of telling a deeper story that makes more people feel seen. And so rather than running away from that, we should run into that and we should lean into that and do a better job of telling those stories and, and making sure that Again, when you put your product out into the world, that you can stand by it and you can say, I made these decisions for this reason. And maybe I'll make different ones based on this feedback, but you shouldn't run away from it. It should inform, I think, inform your storytelling. Uh, one more question, and I want to make sure to get Jackie down here in front. Um, you missed her the first time. Hello, uh, thank you for being here. Um, so Danielle, you kind of mentioned how black women are portrayed in media in reference to Megan Thee Stallion and Tory Lane's case specifically. And as I was kind of seeing that roll out like on Twitter and online, I think I noticed that a lot of kind of rap blogs and the Shade Room-esque blogs kind of had a pretty notable stake in that narrative. And I think there was one blog with a pretty notable following that before the conviction even came out, they said like Tory Lanez was found not guilty and obviously that wasn't the case. So my question is, what is kind of the role of these kind of blogs within the digital revolution and how can we target misinformation in online black spaces, particularly that of which targets black women and spews massage noir? Well, let's end on a bang, okay. <laughs> <laughs> do we have oh my goodness um oh i have a lot of thoughts <laughs> um, um okay so i think about the shade room i think about the breakfast club i think about a number of um entities that that do have a quite a stake in the culture um that don't adhere to the same journalistic um uh, <laughs> the same journalistic, uh, sorry, standards, yes, thank you, standards that we do, um, which can be really difficult, right, uh, because their reach can oftentimes be so much um, larger than, than, uh, than news outlets um, and, and the traditional publications. So... If you had asked me this question five to 10 years ago, I probably wouldn't an have answered it this way. The Shade Room has shifted in its role. And I think that we have to take it a little bit more seriously than we have um, because of the impact it has. Um, there's been a discourse around uh, funding of the police, police funding, um, and a lot of a lot of organizations that have a stake in funding police organizations actually fund the Shade Room. And so the way that that information has been disseminated on the Shade Room specifically um, has been sort of fear mongering, right? And kind of talking about violence in the community and the lack of police resources. And, and then if you look at the Shade Room comments, which are always a lovely place to spend your time, you find people um, you know, having really complicated conversation. Um, I really struggle with the, the, the power that that has, quite frankly, and the hold it has on our community. I will be honest with you, it is largely the reason why I decided to take the job at Essence. Um, we no longer really have a black media publication outlet that is owning our stories and educating our community the way that Ebony and Essence once did. And we are finding that, like I, when the 35th, I think, anniversary of A Different World happened and the, and the Breakfast Club got that interview, like <laughs> what? Like Dwayne and Whitley, went, Kadeem Hardison and, uh, and Jasmine Guy went on The Breakfast Club 
to have that interview. And I thought to myself, like, who? someone else could have gotten this. Who? I mean, the Breakfast Club actually is really impactful. <laughs> and so I do think we have an obligation to reclaim our power. Essence has an obligation to reclaim its power in this space. Ebony has an obligation to reclaim its power in this space. Black media has an obligation to reclaim its power, reclaim its responsibility to the community. Um, I include the shade room in that because we can't, the, the, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. The shade room is what it is. I won't even lie. I go to the shade room once a week and I'm like, what's, what's popping? And, you know, I think that it's, it's been, there's a strategy that's been brilliant, quite frankly. Um, but again, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. And so I think there's certainly an obligation to tell stories responsibly. And there is an obligation for the media to uh, present options outside of the shade room and the breakfast club. And so that's a lot of what I'm trying to do is to give another option. Um, because unfortunately right now, I don't know that we have that many. And so it is largely the reason why I took this job. Okay. Danielle, Marcus, it's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Before we leave, I'd love to thank all of you in this room, um, our Dean Whitaker, our faculty, uh, the students who've joined us, members of the Northwestern alumni community, uh, and the One Book, One Northwestern community. Thank you all uh, for coming out. Thank you all who are joining us uh, on the live stream. Uh, thank you for spending this time with us. And a special shout out to IMC 591, my cultural and inclusion and marketing students. I know y'all are there. Thank you all. Be safe getting home. Have a good night.